you don't wake up one day be like you know i'm gonna devote all my time and my energy to give back you did that why we never knew we were poor because everybody else was around us was poor. To me, charity is not just giving. Charity is how you give. Family is not like it used to be. How do we come back? We always pride ourselves. We're Arab. Family is a big deal to us. But we're going downhill. How do we bring it back up? Does blood really make you family? There's drug addictions or the imams are not doing enough. Is it the imam? If I don't bring my kids to the mosque, why am I blaming the, the imam for it? First thing they're scared of, people are gonna say, oh, look at the dad, like he didn't know how to control his son. You put me in a room with Yemenis, I'm a Yemen. Mm -hmm. You put me with Iraqi, I'm an Iraqi. Imagine how strong we are, so we're all one. We're still fighting Sunni Shia. I don't care if you say Shia or you're, you say you're Sunni. You're defeated, both ends, you lost. We're distracted by the wrong things. They want us to buy it. Where do you think we're lacking? You open up a can of worms. <laughs> to me, these, these people in these high positions in our community. Before we start today's episode, I just wanted to thank you for taking the time out of your day and giving this podcast to listen. And I also wanted to remind you that the only way this podcast will ever grow is with your support and with your help. So subscribe to the podcast, like this video, and now let's get the show started. Welcome aboard Middle East Airlines. <laughs> Hajimo, how are you? Alhamdulillah, how are you? Thank you for coming. Alhamdulillah, thank you for having me. So, first, you don't need an introduction to a lot of people, but the way I want you to introduce yourself is who's Imo Zayat when he looks in the mirror? Who's Imo to Imo? Imo. Emo is a product of this community. Mm -hmm. Alhamdulillah, I've been blessed to have some great mentors, some great people in my circle to pull me together. When I was younger, I could have easily, you know, you can take one way or the other. Alhamdulillah, I had some great uh, friends who, who stood by me Guided me, guided me down the right path. Now, mind you, I'm still no uh, Yeah, I'm not perfect, but it's good to surround yourself with great people who who look look out for one another. I'm a product of, a, of the co community who helped uh, mold me into the good that's in me. Okay, that's that's a good way to introduce yourself. The podcast is called "Not From Here" because we're not from here. So I want you to tell the story of how you ended up here. My parents left the war in Lebanon. I was born in Lebanon. Okay. I'm from Syri I'm Syrian descent. My father's Syrian, my mother's Lebanese. We left the war in Lebanon, came here in 1973. I grew up in the south end of Dearborn. My parents are still there in the south end of Dearborn. My roots <laughs> is, uh, are from the south end. And that's where I get the mentality of it takes a village to raise a kid. Because mm -hmm. that's where... That's the village that basically raised me. How old were you when you came? Seven months old. Oh, no recollection of anything that happened back there. No. And do you go back often? I tried. The last two trips I've made to Lebanon were through the foundation. Okay. To do uh, God's work. Alhamdulillah. But I try to go back every two years, not a lot of, you know, for either work or, or pleasure. How do you feel... How's your connection with Lebanon, with home? It's depressing. Hmm. And you're taking me down that road. Um, it's depressing because the, the division there is here. Okay. You know, the, the nationalism, what we were talking about off camera. The nationalism, the sectarianism, the Sunni Shia, Christian, uh, Druze, you know what I'm saying? That division that's in Lebanon has been dragged into our community here. So you feel like that weakens your connection with back home or it makes it stronger because it's the same thing that's happening here? It, it weakens it and it's depressing because okay. it's such a beautiful place. But it's it's depressing to see, uh, see it torn apart like that. Mm -hmm. To me, I look at Lebanon... It's like uh, like the Godfather. 
Yeah. Heads of the family. The Christians, the Jews, the the, the Druze, the Sunnis, the Shias, the, the the division amongst them, the families, that's who run the country. It's not a, mm-hmm. it's not a it's government on paper, but in reality. It's heads of the table. Heads heads of the heads of the uh, your, your the religions. Mm. And over here, it's becoming like that, but Yemeni community, Lebanese community, Syrian, Iraqi, Palestinian. You know, the same concept same of concept. division, just here. And, and let me tell you, with a little Sunni Shia undertone. Oh, okay. I see what you're saying. We usually go to Lebanon. The typical Joe goes to Lebanon to have fun on vacation. That's kind of what's expected when the people encounter you. Where are you from? Oh, where do you live? America. Oh, you're here on vacation. You mentioned that you go there to do God's work, um, to help out. Do they look at you different? They don't know where I'm going, why I'm going. But when they ask me, who are you? But I'm Syrian at heart. Yeah. But who I am stays is, is who I am. It's inside of me. I don't wear it on my sleeves. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Where you go there, oh, head of the first thing, ayah da'ah. Yeah. That's the biggest thing. They speak through da'ahs. You know it better than I do. Yeah. Head of the Jbal, head of the Aita, head of the Nabatiya, head of the Tibnain, you know. And that's the same, same mentality over here, but they do it in more nationalism setting mm. than it is village or Secretarianism. So you're saying they don't know that you're there to help? No, they don't. Okay. Do you have any stories? Yes, of I do. back home. Yes, I do. You know something that shocked you there after you went back. When uh, one time, me and Hassan a friend of mine, we're in the Nabatiya. Yeah. See an older lady crossing the street, uh, holding two big bags of garbage. She, she was probably my mother's age, if not older. So we were probably about a good 30 yards away. We stopped the car. We both get out. We grabbed the garbage bags from her. Didn't say nothing. Salaamu alaykum haji. Atkhanina nsa'adik. Took the garbage bags from her. And, w- and the garbage b- was probably a good another 30 yards in the other direction mm-hmm. to throw it away. We took it and threw it away. The whole time, somebody from the village, from the Nab- Nabatiya, was sitting in the car watching us, see what we were doing. The lady was in shock. We took the garbage, threw it out, turned back around. She was still frozen. <laughs> she still <laughs> looking at us. Anything. Yeah. So we're walking back to our car, and the guy goes to me. He goes, where are you from? I go, Anisure from America, Syrian from America. He's Lebanese from America. He goes, these actions that you just did are not normal around here. Wow. Not, now, mind you, this is Nabatiya. Yeah. Like, we talk secretarianism. Strong Shia, big Shia community, you know, village. And he's at the mean t- at the whole time he's, he's shaking my hand and he won't let go. He goes, uh, he goes, this these actions are not common around here. So I hit him with uh, some of us wear Ahl al Bat on our sleeves, and some of us wear it in our hearts and mm. our actions. Yeah, that's a good response. And I told him, I just hope that these were the actions of Ahl al-Bayt. And if that was ever my mother walking uh, across in the street or carrying the garbage like that, somebody would reach out and help her. He felt a little shocked. Like I took a dig at him, Mm -hmm. but was still kind of impressed. So he looked at me and just nodded his head. He goes, thank you. And I had to pull my hand away. And we turned around, walked away, got in the car with Hassan. I told Hassan, I go, I think we left a lasting impression on this guy. He really, but the whole time, like I was driving down Ford Road and Beach Daily today, seeing an old lady crossing the street. I didn't want to scare her, so I was going to reach out, you know, ask her, how's your waslik? But then I seen she was just going to Greenland. The whole time we lived in, we always, Hassan the just picking up people. Come on, we're going this way. Let me take you from village to village. Yeah. People find it odd. You felt like people found it odd? Yes. So that didn't happen just once? No, no. A couple of times we've we've helped people uh, just... We'd be riding, the older man, walking from village to village. And, you know, those villages, is not an easy walk. Mm-hmm. We'd pick them up and, 
you hear their stories and their struggles. Allah is Adon. What's one thing you learned from the people back there? They're very proud. Mm. Very proud. Um, they need help. But uh, I don't think they're getting the help they need. I mean, if you don't have somebody outside Lebanon, you're not surviving. Does that put pressure on the things that you're doing that, oh, I have to make sure that now that you've seen the people in this, you've seen that they need help. So you're not just operating an organization here. Now you're actually seeing what's happening back there. You know, it does. We've learned to adjust mm. what started off as feeding and clothing here. We've learned to develop resources here to be able to get, help these people here. Mm. And we were able to grow in the sense where we've helped in Yemen. Before we did Lebanon and Syria, we helped the people of Lebanon, of Yemen. Uh, we've helped Palestine. Before we've done... So I'm one of those... Uh, let me take care of my brothers before I take care of myself. Mm -hmm. My Yemeni brothers, my my Palestinian brothers, you know. So this year, Ramadan, we fed in Palestine, we fed in Yemen, we fed in Iraq, we fed in Syria, we fed in Lebanon, we did Pakistan, we did India, and we did here. Mm. So we've learned to adjust our resources in our community here, where, okay, this organization does this, okay, we can partner with, with them here to help these people here. You know, and, and shift some of our efforts over there where there's a bigger need. Mm. And you mentioned that you're from Syrian descent. Do you have uh, like a soft spot for Syria? I always do. Before I went to Lebanon, I went to Syria in 06 for six okay. days. Okay. I loved Syria. That was a country before the war. Yeah. Zero deficit. The people of Lebanon used to come on vacation in Syria. Yeah. They come and get educated in Syria. The medicine was free. You know, they took that country back a hundred years. Maybe not a hundred, but they took them back a long time. Mm. Um, well, you know, everybody's proud of where they come from. Yeah. You know, it, it was a beautiful country. I loved how Christians, Sinners, Shia, they all lived together. They didn't separate, they didn't discriminate you, once another. So you don't, didn't see that separation there that you see in Lebanon yeah no none at all I actually and that's I didn't see it and then when I was speaking to one of my cousins I asked him I go I goes are we in the Shia sect or the Sunni sect or and they go no no there's none of that over here they wow. don't speak of it I didn't know that yes that's how I was brought up I was brought up in the south end Yemenis Palestinian Palestinian yeah. Yeah. American, no, you're a South Under. That was like its own country, mm -hmm. own own national, and, uh, own group. Everybody knew you as a South Under, even, even to this day. Mm. People from the South End, you talk to them, you tell them you're from the South End, they wear, they wear it with pride. Yeah. Talk it's to like, me about those early days in the South End. How was the, how was the childhood growing up? How were your parents dealing with it coming from Lebanon? My mother's been here 50 years. Mm. Never drove. Doesn't drive. Up till now? Up till now. She never drove. You have everything. It's, it's like living in a daya. Yeah. But I, you can live in Bindishbel or Timnan or Aita, wherever village, you don't need to drive, right? Mm. Everything's within walking distance. Yeah. There's a mosque. There's a butcher's market. There's a grocery store. There's a laundromat. There's a doctor's office. Shubat Badulwa, a pharmacy, yeah. a gas station, everything's within walking distance. It was a small village. So everybody knew everybody. Yeah. So if I was running around on the streets, breaking windows, I'm not worried about my father. I'm worried about everybody around me. Because everyone knows you. Everybody knows you. Hey, that, and I'm not, everybody don't know me as Imo or Imad. They know me, Hida ibn Hassan al Zayyid. Yeah. So if I screw up, before I ruin my reputation, I'm ruining my dad's reputation. My that had a big, reputation. That had a big effect on your psyche? Big psyche. Big effect. I try to teach that to my kids now. 
Come just remember, when you do things and the way you act in public, you're not Medina Al Zayat. You haven't made a name for yourself. Mm. You're not Mirvat or Maryam Al Zayat. You haven't made a name for yourself yet. Nobody knows you. You've only been around 24, 21, 19 years. I go, you're Emo's daughter. You're Danielle's daughter. They know who your parents are. So what your actions here now is a reflection of your parents. So to me, that's, that's where this generation's lacking. That takes a village to raise a kid. Yeah. Uh, we're losing it. You separated the village now. There is no village anymore. No. But I can come up to somebody, grab his son by the ear. I seen him doing something wrong. Smack him on the neck and tell him I'm going to tell your parents. And they'll tell you, I'm sorry, I won't do it again. Oh, do you Please, still do that? Yes, 100%. Please don't tell my parents I won't do it anymore. Yeah. But I can't do it to my brother or sister's kids. That's where family is not like it used to be. There's not a bond like it used to be. Yeah. We're letting this social media divide us. How do you how do we come back? Because those parts are essential, they're important. How do we come back? We always pride ourselves in that we're Ar we're Arab and Family is a big deal to us. You know, we're not the type where we leave our parents' houses at 18 years old or, or like we we stay with our parents until it's actually time to leave. And now you're seeing that we're not like 100% there. Like we're not at point zero yet, but we're going downhill. How do we bring it back up? That's a good question. I don't know how. We lost a lot of culture. And the village to raise a kid was strong with us because that was the culture. You said a very important word, culture, because we know we live off of two things, religion and culture. So we lost the culture. We're losing it. So that's that's the important part. That's the, this. Important, the important part. Okay. I feared my uncles just as much as my dad. You know, to me, it's, it's it's we're losing that. You know, we always thought family, family, family. Now you see, you see it. Does blood really make you family? Not really, not anymore. Not at like not like it was before, at least. Not like it was before. If I tell you, growing up in the South End, my family, me, and my cousins, we're a good maybe 30, 30 boys, and we were close. Almost like a little gang. What you're saying is basically, if you need a favor, sometimes you're inclined to call a stranger and you feel more comfortable calling a stranger than calling someone that's actually blood related to you. 100%. For that favor. And to me, I don't believe in favors. Mm. You help because that's the thing to do. Mm. My you mom never owe me. My mom tells me that a lot. To she, me, there's nothing called favors. Uh, Anybody, you ask anybody that ever asks, calls me and say, Emo, I need a favor from you. Tom, there's no favors between brothers. There's no favors between sisters. I have Brother to help sister. you. Hey, the and to me, you open up a can of worms. <laughs> to me, these, these people in these high positions in our community, it's not. You got there. You didn't get there on your own. Yes, you held, you held your qualifications, helped you get there. Helped. Helped. Community also helped. Whether it helped make you the man you are, whether it helped with some influence here or there, the community helped make you. So don't forget where you come from. So when somebody, when somebody needs something, it's not you owe me. Nobody owes Emo anything. And Emo don't owe nobody ever anything. Because everything we do, it's, it's, it's an obligation. It's mandatory. It's not an obligation. It's, I, I, I'm sorry. It's a, you're obligated to help. Yeah. It's mandatory to help one another. Some people are going to uh, see it differently. Yeah. I, I don't. Okay. I, I have complete strangers that I've never met before. They'll call me and they tell me, I need a favor, one, two, three. Tell them, 
I'll help you as much as I can. That's the whole. But it's not a favor. That's the whole base of the work you do. Anyways, you can't be thinking about I'm gonna go help this group of people and then I expect something in return at one point. Or yeah, hundred percent. Don't ever do if you're doing something and expecting something in return. Don't do it. Mm. Don't do it. I agree. Because then, what's your need? What's your intentions? Yeah. Is it to help somebody? Or to get help back? Or to get to get help back in the future? Because at the end of the day, if your intentions are pure, God will give it back to you. Yeah. Whether it's through this person or through something else. Or through something else. It might be through your to your kids. I, I'm fairly younger. Uh, you don't wake up one day, especially like the people in my generation, and be like, you know, I'm going to devote all my time and my energy to give back. You did that. What led to you taking that decision that I'm going to start a foundation and I'm going to start giving back? What were the factors that played a role in building that in yourself? Because you need you need it to be ingrained in you to be like, I'm going to spend the next 30, 40 years on doing this. It's not like a one-time thing. It's not, I'm going to this charity event, I'm going to do my part and then go back home and do my thing. You took this as a full-time commitment. Why and how? You know, growing up in the South End, my father worked three jobs. We never knew we were poor because everybody else was around us was poor. Never خلان and his. never أسر مننا. He always gave us more than we deserved. يعني. Those, when I come home from, say football practice, and I see my father sitting on the porch. And he was a carpenter. He was a carpenter. This is this is all at the same time. He was a carpenter. Worked at a gas station, and worked at the factory. There were three jobs and a restaurant. Four jobs he carried. At one time. He'd come home, after doing a job, and he'd pull the wire, the copper wire, out of the wiring, out of the plastic tubings, and he'd put it in a, in like a box, like a banana box. Don Baba, what are you doing? He goes, Hale, take him to the junkyard, sell him. Say he got $40 from him. He'd take $40 out of his pocket, put it on top of him, and give it to the poor. Mind you, he had six kids he had to feed and, and take care of. So when, when that stuff that was embedded in me and I didn't realize it till I was on the field trip with my daughter that I tell everybody and when you're sitting on that bus what what happened a lot goes through your mind so I'm watching you know as a police officer you always observe our, of your surroundings and I look and I happen to look in front of me and down and you see a kid with a pair of shoes one shoe is normal the other shoe the top is cut off holes in it it took me back you know took me back when I was a kid you remembered what I remembered you know the struggles my dad went through we didn't have some of the things that we didn't have but we never noticed it because everybody around everybody else around us was the same way yeah you know so I started thinking I said you know what when I get back to the school I'm going to buy this kid a pair of shoes. Because I know when I was a kid and I didn't have a good pair of shoes or it was a name brand, kids can be bullies. Yeah. The first thing when, you know, in the South End, everybody makes fun of somebody. You know, you, you rep, you give each other nicknames. First thing they pick on is your clothes. Yeah. Your shoes, your clothes. Yeah, look at this guy's shoes. Look at this guy's clothes. Look at his pants. They got. So I said, you know what? I'm going to go buy this kid a pair of shoes. I told the teacher... I'm going to run the target. This is my number. As soon as you get off the bus, you give me his shoe size. 
So I go there, go to Target. She calls me. I buy the kid two pairs of shoes, and I bring them back. She goes, what if his parents don't let me ta- let him take them? I go, then every day he steps foot in his classroom, he switches shoes out. Don't tell him who gave him the shoes, and don't tell him who's, who my daughter is. I don't want nothing. I don't want this kid to know anything. She goes, okay. Alhamdulillah, he took the shoes, and I never heard nothing else about him. But that's what got the Emily Foundation going. That 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 part that, 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 that part right there. That was the first act of charity we've done. We did, and we did it for, for about four years, with no name. Nobody knew what I was doing. I'd leave, come home, leave, come home, do what we have to do. Just kept it on the down low. People started finding out what you're doing. Oh, Ramadan's coming. I heard what you do in Ramadan. Ramadan, we used to take hot meals from local restaurants, freshly cooked, and deliver them to families in need right before iftar. Mm. The first year we did it was the same year that we did the shoes. I said, you know what? Ramadan's coming. I was talking to a few friends of mine. I said, we're going to feed a family every day during Ramadan. The first year of Ramadan, we ended up feeding about three family, 30 families three times a week during Ramadan. And I was going from Taylor to Dearborn to Oak Park, dropping off food, coming back home, and then uftaring. My mother would be cleaning up the table, her and my wife, and I'd be sitting down to uftar some days. And then it slowly grew. Okay, we had leftover money from Ramadan. I can't keep it. Let's do backpacks. Yeah. Then Thanksgiving came along. Thanksgiving, subhanAllah, we used to cook, we, when we first started, we were given freshly cooked meals, whole meals. So first day of Ramadan, uh, first uh, Thanksgiving comes around, I had six families. I knocked on the door of one house, and the door opened. Like while you were knocking? Yeah, while I was knocking the door open. So I yelled, hello, hello, no one answered. Picked up the food, put it on their dinner table. Walked out and shut the door. I said, that's probably one of the best feelings I've ever had. No one knows. No one knew nothing. No one seen nothing. Got in my car and drove off. And to me, after that point, I said, you know what? We're going to try to be as discreet as possible. To me, charity is not just giving. Charity is how you give. Big one. How you give. People, people say, oh, Emo, Emo don't do this, or Emo doesn't help here, Emo, the Emory Foundation doesn't down here. Emory Foundation doesn't brag about what they do. Some things we do show, but one thing we don't believe in showing is the recipients. Mm. I'm all for encouraging and empowering our youth. You come to me and you say you want to do a story of me uh, about me at one of our food drives. I'll tell you, don't do it about me. Do it about this 16-year-old kid who's here who could be sitting on the couch watching TV or watching football but would rather be here helping out. Helping out. Those are the people. Those are the real heroes in our community. It's not, it's not always about money. We see a lot of people here, I'll, oh, I'll cut you a check. You know what, what I tell people? You see you, that a lot, probably. I see that a lot. Take take the money. I'm, listen, I'm not in it for the money. Give me your kid more before you give me your money. And if we don't have an impact on your kid, keep your money. That's what you care about. That's all I care about. Because I want to be a part of that village when somebody says, you know, we volunteered with the Amity Foundation, and now he's a doctor. Now he's a, la- a lawyer, mm. or a judge, or or, 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 or inshallah, Ya a president. Why do we set our bars low for our kids? We shouldn't. The sky's the limit, but it starts with all of us. If we don't come together. Who are some of the people that 
that helped you get to that point? You mentioned your dad. You know, but yes. like people, uh, let me explain myself more. People here, okay, they they might have like a certain. Um, way that their life is going maybe they did grow up poor they did see their dad work a lot but at the same time they see Hajimo doing things there they look up to Hajimo be like i want to be like that maybe he's he's helping you out and then he learns something from you who did you learn from you know this is like a two-part question to me okay people people now with us that have a big influence on my life mm -hmm. and, I, and and what we do are people like Hajj Walker, Hajj Catfish, you know, Hajj Fuad, but everybody knows Hajj Walker and Hajj Muhammad Wade on Catfish, Azam Elder, Mike Misher, Abe Misher. You know, those are some of my core uh, brothers that helped guide me, you know, growing up and even till this day. Then you have, and we come back to, it takes a village, people like, like Alir Hamo, Ali Papai Berry, who through sports, taught us how to play sports. He was like a second father for, to us in the South End. Taught us how to play sports. Taught me how the importance of building a kid's confidence, you know, and always gave back to the youth. And, and charity is not always, you know, he gave us through money, but mo charity is not always through money. Sometimes charity is through time. Sometimes charity is just building a kid's confidence. That's what Papa gave us. Then we had Imad Fadlallah, Allah Yerhamu, Sayyid Imad Fadlallah in high school. Made you proud of where you came from. How did he make you proud? He knew the struggles my dad went through. He knew my family. So when I was the kid goofing off in school, he pulled he pulled me to the side. And subhanAllah, you know, I told him, I told him, you know, I go, you don't remember it. But you gave me a beating in school that today I'm over 40 and I still remember it. Because it had an impact on me. What did you do? To get I was goofing around in class, you know, being a class clown. And he, he told me, he goes, do you know what your father does for a living? I go, yeah, you know. He goes, no, you don't. And every time he'd answer the question, even though I thought it was right, huh? he'd slap me. He'd slap me. And the whole class started laughing. And to me, I was starting to get annoyed. But then Commissioner Abdainte, he told me, your father works so hard to provide for you. And to give you the the better things in life. And without school, you're not going to be able to do this for your family. Yeah. He goes, plus, don't forget where you came from. Being, being Arab and being a Muslim. Mm. He goes, look at everybody laughing at you. Do you want to, is this the path you want in life? How old were you? I was, uh, I think, a junior in high school. Okay. And it stuck with me. And Allah Rahma before he died, you know, we, I used to always tell him the story. What an impact he had on my life with that. And then Allah Rahma, my mother in law. What did your mother in law do? My mother in law taught taught me how to give. Even though my dad did the same thing. Yeah. But he he showed me at a younger age. At an older age, my mother in law, Allah Rahma, the day after I buried her, we buried her. I was walking off the from the cemetery and I was pulled to the side by, by a gentleman in the community. He told me, you know, your mother-in-law told me never to say anything. But every time she came into my store to buy groceries for the mosque, she'd pay with two credit cards. She'd pay half with the credit card from the mosque. And she promised me, she made me promise I would never say anything. But you need to know this. She paid the other half with her credit card. And she never told nobody. 
she was responsible of getting the, she was the one her mother was the one that made the the ba'a recipe, recipe at the mosque okay so when she took over her mother's legacy she can continue doing it from her mother so she'd pay you know the mosque would tell her pay for all on their mas on their credit card but she was always paying half she was always looking to give without nobody knowing he goes this is one of many stories that I can tell you about your mother-in-law when she'd come to me and she wants to help a family how'd she do it and that comes back to where I tell you it's how we give when we do charity in our community we need to humble ourselves a little bit more I'm not perfect I am not a nobody but those are some of the people that really had a uh, lasting imp impression on me in my life. What's one rule that you set for yourself that you'll never break? Taking pictures with somebody that we helped. You won't do that? I won't do that. I had companies like AAA. I had Al Jazeera call me who wanted to do stories. AAA wanted to do a food drive and people pull up. I tell them I refuse to. We'll fund everything. I told him I won't. And even if the person's okay with it? Even if the person's okay with it. Because mm. when, when you're doing charity, I'm a strong believer. They're helping me more than I'm helping them. I don't know if you believe the same thing, but I really, to me, when, I, when we help somebody or when I help somebody, when I walk up to that door and I give them something, I tell them thank you. Because that's for my soul. Mm. It's, they're, they're helping us. We're not helping them. Yeah. To me, they might tell you, yeah, but deep down inside, do they really mean yeah? Do they really need it that they're willing to show themselves like yeah. that? I had Al Jazeera call us and wanted to do a story. I told him, you can drive down the street with me, but you can't film the, the, sign, the street sign. Mm. You can show the numbers on the house. You can show my feet or the volunteers' foot, feet as they're going up the steps. And don't show the people any, any part of the person at the house. They go, you don't leave us much to work with. I go, that's my point. And they didn't work with you? I told them, there's other organizations. You can go to them, but uh, it's I, I refuse to. Although that could have got you some good... Uh... Publicity? Yeah. Sometimes when you grow, there's positive and there's negatives with growth. Yeah. There's days where I'll say, I wish we were still the 10, 15 guys and young girls just doing the little stuff. Mm. But then again, you say with growth, what came with growth? Helping a lot of more people. A lot more people. A lot more. A lot different things. So Do you see the effects of it? Like, like actually see the effects of it? Yes. Moving forward? Yes. Like, we're a foundation where we, if we see, alhamdulillah, since we started, I can tell you off the top of my head, maybe about 10 other organizations that started. Mm. And I'm not saying they started from me, but the, the people wanted to do good and they started their own. They started their own, which is great. You know, which is fantastic. But if I see Jafar feeding, there's no need for Imo to feed. Mm -hmm. I can support Jafar under, uh, under, under, through Jafar from behind the scenes. Mm. Let me take the Emory Foundation someplace else. Yeah. So, uh, so you basically want it to work like uh, like we're all connected in a way I you know love for that. if if this person's feeding let me go do something else i don't even i don't have to feed the same street the same i'll go it, it, do something else exactly. that person would do their own thing and then that's how you get a, a wider range of help for people in different areas yeah i find a void in the community and i try to go that way and once it gets it doesn't matter it doesn't matter where what the people are no, or what no. the, to me I'm a community guy. Now, community is not Syrian American. It's not Lebanese American. It's not Arab American. It's not a Muslim or Shia. 
It's my borders. I don't care what you are or where you came from. If you live within my borders, you're my number one priority. Because mm. at the end of the day, my kids are going to school with these kids. Should I make my neighbor, because his parents are going through hard times, feel any less than my kid? Is that fair? It's not. But why should I leave, ignore my neighbor? He might be an American, uh, uh, African-American or American or whatever. Why should I ignore my neighbor to go help somebody, uh, say in Taylor? or, or What's the difference? There's more of a tie to this young man or young woman than I do with the guy in another city. My kids hang out with him. I see him. He's a bigger priority. Yeah. And at the end of the day, we all know that the prophet took care of his Christian and Jewish neighbors. What makes us any less? Yeah. We kind of lost focus of that. Yeah. We talk about what our prophets did and what our imams did. And turn around and do completely the opposite. Yeah, you're seeing you know, a lot of that. You, we see, we see a lot of that. And, I, and I'm, I'm not being a, I'm not discrediting anybody how they do ch- the, their type of ch- their charity. You do it the way you want to, and we'll do it the way we want to do it. Mm. You're probably one of the people that seem the most out of the community, the good, the bad. And I'm talking about not specifically tight. Uh, to the area that we live in in general Ar- arabs muslims you seem the most where do you think we're lacking Akhla. Mm. i think we're losing the akhla, our actions we talk it you and i we walk anywhere in this country we stick out like a sore thumb that it says Arabs, and just like the stereotype, everybody thinks every Arab is a Muslim. Mm. They don't know there's a lot of sects of Arabs, religious sects. We, it's tougher for us because we have examples we got to set. Examples for our kids. I'll be walking with my kids. I'll pick up garbage. It's not even mine. My kids will see it, but it's also let the Somebody who doesn't know us, but no looks at me, they're gonna stereotype me. Oh, he's an Arab. Yeah. Oh, well, he's different. Look, 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 look how they are. That's what Islam is. That's what we are. It's true that that's actions, who we are. Not, not. We speak it more than we do, we do it. That's what I'm about to say. We we're. I feel this is. I feel like we're too focused on, on talking and preaching and. No one is actually doing the work. Like, no one's being a good role model that a little kid can look up to and be like, "I want to be, I want to be a Muslim like this person," you know? Because every older person is just speaking, speaking. That's all you see. It's just all talk, no, no action. Hundred percent. All talk, no action. And what's happening? Where do we start? Yeah, that's a good that's a good question. Where do we start? Do we start? You know, we are quick to blame. First and foremost, our our, our imams. Yeah, that's where everybody. That's that's the easiest rock to throw. Everybody looks to throw everything at the mosque, whether we there's drug drug addictions or the imams are not doing enough or any any problems there. The imams are not doing enough. But is it the imams? If I don't bring my kids to the mosque. Why am I blaming the, the imam for it? What are we doing to bring our kids to the mosque? To to teach them this stuff. Don't get me wrong. I think our imams need to come down and be more on the ground. And you're seeing it more with this younger generation of imams in our community. But where do we where do we go? Where do, what are we going to do before it's too late? Yeah. We're quick to blame them. You know, every time there's a drug overdose in our community, 
you know, whatever our imams are doing. Imams can't do everything. Drugs is a whole different story too. We, we, we don't talk about it enough. We don't talk about it enough. Because everybody... They're scared they're of scared. the judgment. They're scared of the judgment. And that's, that's, back to your point, that's working against this community that we, you have to build. You know, like, if you have a problem, you, you have to tell your brother about the problem. So if your brother's having the problem, you guys can connect and see where to start at the solution. But if everyone's going to deny the problem, everyone's going to say, no, we don't have a drug problem in the community, it's it's not going to get fixed. If everyone's going to be scared to say that in their household, they're like, there's a problem, there's a drug problem. First thing they're scared of, people are going to say, oh, look at the dead. Like you yeah. said, like, oh, look at the dead. He didn't know how to control his son. Or look at that mom. She couldn't control her daughter or whatever. Here's the thing. Parents are only responsible in my eyes. Now, mind you, I see things differently. Parents do the best they can to a certain point in a kid's life. If you don't know who the circle of friends your kids are with, everything you taught them to this point is thrown out the window. Unless you surround your kids with the same values you have. Think about it. You, you, When you're home, you sleep six to seven hours out of a 24-hour day, have dinner another hour, right there you're at eight hours, shower, you know, the th- one, th- one third of your life is spent at home. Yeah. The other 16 hours, between their friends and school, and even when there was school, there's friends and... So there's too too many factors that you can't control. And you can't. Yeah, and I, I agree. It's not all the parents' fault. The parents, okay, they have some part of the the problem, but we, we if if we don't talk about the stuff as a community, where it's not gonna go anywhere. It's just gonna become worse and worse and worse. And it's not only drugs. It's it's a bunch of different issues. You know, there's suicide. A- the we like when's the last time we talked about suicide? And what's happening suicide you know i i, I know 100 percent that a lot is happening and yeah no one no one's going to talk about that stuff no and we're not doctors sometimes they just need somebody to talk to it doesn't even have to be a doctor you know what i'm saying somebody that can that's trustworthy for them to vent to listen i've seen grown men crack you don't release what's inside you, you'll break. They just need somebody to talk to. Mm-hmm. And we don't give, parents nowadays don't give their kids that, that luxury, that, that, that comfort zone for them to be, to be someone they can come to. Mm. And, and that's the problem with uh, not just depression and suicide and stuff, but that also becomes a problem trying to raise young girls in this community. Young girls specifically, you said? Young girls. Explain that to me. I'm a father of three daughters. Okay. If my daughters can't come talk to me or can't come talk to their mother, you never know who they're going to go talk to. And just like you know, girls are a little more emotional and vulnerable than a man is or a boy is. Allah yabad an banat al-alam. But you never know what's, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Who's who's going to catch your daughter's ear? You're not as worried about the boys. Boys, I believe in tough love. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Talk to them, okay. You got it out of your system. Sid Yeah. <laughs> I have three girls, so I wouldn't know how to do it with a boy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's see, money and food were no longer an issue, right? And, and I'm talking specifically about the work you do. So money is not an issue. Food is not an issue. You still want to give because that's who you are. Where do you go? Where do you start? Can I tell you things that we've done that, that have nothing sure. to do with money? Of and food? course. Last year, we brought back district-wide spelling bee. What is that? A spelling bee in all of Dearborn Public Schools that compete against each, against each other. And each grade will get a first place and a second place winner. Mm-hmm. To me, that was beautiful. 
Um, this uh, last year, we also partnered up with a group from from Fordson. We did a special needs prom. To me, that, that that's probably the best thing we've ever done. Partner up with these guys to give young special kids and, who have special needs a prom where they feel special. That that day is all about them. And you see, last year I stood in the back and I watched these kids. And I cried to see them, a little glow stick, what an impact it had on them. Or singing on a microphone, how happy it made them. This is something that that probably surpasses everything we've ever done. Does it feel better oh, than money? Oh, giving them better. money? Get, get way better. Putting this together for them is way better. Did you have any interaction with any of yes, them? Yes, yes. That... You know, you say, see you, parents tell you thank you. Some of them remember you from last year. They come up and they hug you. They want to dance with you. You know, it's just, it's it's a different feeling that you don't understand and that we take so much for granted. It's nice for the parents to see their kids that probably, like they're going through a hard time. It's, it's always hard and it's challenging to raise someone with special needs. So when, when events like this come along, they probably feel so much joy seeing their kid. Uh, to, to see them happy. Yeah. You know, even though the simplest thing makes them happy, the smallest thing that we take for granted, it's just, it, it's amazing. And we do a back-to-school bash where we get pony rides and car rides and petting zoo and face painting, and we barbecue for them. I just realized that these three activities are for activities that you just mentioned about what you would do if money and food aren't an issue, are directly related to kids, like you would give back to those kids. 100%. Tomorrow we're having uh, a small business fair for kids from 6 to 14. And kids that might, might be on lemonade stand, might, might be bracelets, they might bake at home and they sell them. So we're having what started off as 40 vendors as over 80 vendors. Wow. We have we had over 150 applicants. And in, in the first place prize gets $100 for these kids and we have a couple first place prize winners and different categories. It's just my th- that's where a little hamo papai Ali Berry the, instilled in me. See when you do things you see where it's coming from, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Giving back to these kids. So in a world where kids and their innocence are is being threatened and you see a, a lot of different areas where it's start it's starting to get very difficult to raise young kids because of all the things that are happening around them you're trying to find a space where you're actually making them tougher you're making them stronger you're making them happier it's it's a safe place mm. i want a safe place for our kids you know For about 10 years, I coached Little League football. And to me, you won't understand it unless, and I don't mean you, I'm talking in general. It's something beautiful we have in in our community. I was never Coach Emo. I was always Amo Emo. Mm. We have a beautiful community. The kids grew up with respect. Those kids that I coached at 10 and 12 and 13 years old, are now giving back, working with us at the foundation. Mm. That's a seed that we planted that I never knew I was planting through coaching football, coaching them in football that's grown up to be positive influences in the community and giving back to the community. The beauty of our can people tell me, oh, why don't you move out to Northville? You get more here. Or go to Canton. Or you get more here for your dollar. Because there's something in our community that doesn't show up in your taxes. And that's community. To be able to get, you know, the, I wake up every morning at 5.30, I leave to work in the morning, I see the Sayyid across the street yeah. sitting reading Quran. That's priceless. And, and it, it's a habit. I see the man, I don't care where I'm at, Yeah. Sayyid! At 5.30 in the morning. Yeah. I, one time his wife told me, she was, I told her, Hajjah, 
<laughs> she just shook her head and left. <laughs> but whether it be 11.30 at night or 5.30 in the morning, the beauty of community uh, in our community is, is priceless. And that's what Amity means, community. Believe it or not, you're the fifth person that, uh, since I started interviewing guests, and the five people said the exact same thing. Not out of a question that I asked. They talk about how different Dearborn is and how they would never ever leave because of this strong net community with all the flaws that it has at least we know who the flaws here mm. you, you think moved we to know? Northville do you think we know who the, where the flaws yeah we know who they are you know who the bad apples are mm -hmm. you know who you can leave your kids with and who you can't leave your kids around mm -hmm. in Northville Okay, and no knock to anybody living there. I'm just using them. Do we really know? Do you know everybody in your community over there? No. You know, to me, I know 80% of the people around us. Yeah. Or if I don't know, you can get to anybody in this community through maybe three, four phone calls. Not even. Not even. Less. What do they call it? Degree, five degrees of separation? Yeah. You know, you can get to any... Dear one, it's even, it's even less. Yeah. You said that you would like to use tough love on guys specifically. For all these young men that are coming up here, what's like one message, harsh it may be or not, what would you tell them? Everything's a test. Life is not a race. It's not a sprint. It's a it's a marathon. Just because it gets hard now, it's gonna get easier. Everything always gets easier. Hmm. Even on the bad parts, there's a brighter side. No I stood by a, a man who I think is one of the greatest humans in this community. Wahiyat Allah, I still get chills when I tell the story. I stood by him. He was burying his son. So you stood by him while he was burying his son? He, we took out the casket and we brought it, before we put it in the hearse, they put it on the floor and he stood over his son's body. And I stood next to him. And I put my arm around them and go, Allah irhamu amma. And this is a word that we take grant for granted in our community. Everybody says it, but do they really mean it? He looked at me, he goes, Alhamdulillah. There's nothing, it's, uh, everything happens for a reason. He said, Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. And that's, that's what God wanted. We all talk about religion and this man's bearing his life, bearing his son. And just says, Alhamdulillah, because he knows that's what God's plan was. And everybody says, oh, God's the greatest of planners. It's okay. Your struggles is what's going to make you stronger. You're in the gym, you're lifting weights. If you're struggling with 135, 135, sooner or later, 135 is going to be easy. That struggling is what's going to get you to the 205s, the 305s, or the 405s. It's patience. Everything is not going to be smooth every day. Struggles are okay. Mm. Struggles is what made us. Struggles was growing up in the South End, six kids in a two-bedroom house with my uncle living with us when he first came to this country with no air conditioning. Yeah. Let the air condition. My air conditioning goes out now at home. My kids want to go get a hotel room. They have no patience. Those are struggles. But those struggles early on They're what made you. is what made me now. Think about it. You say, Alhamdulillah, you're burying your son. Because you know you're, you're God. But man Rabbak, you believe in God. God's the greatest of planners. Those are the actions that I was talking about. It's not only talking when, no. when everything is good, when you're sitting uh, feet, uh, feet crossed, and you say, Alhamdulillah, for everything, and then something bad happens and, and suddenly you give up on god and then you give up on god 
those are the actions I was talking about. Like, yeah, we need to stop with the preaching and start with the actions. And actions start with saying alhamdulillah when you're burying your son. Like, this life ain't, isn't going to get harder than that. No. No parent should bury their son. No parent should bury their son. If you want to paint the best case scenario for the Amity Foundation for the next 10 years, where do you see it? You know, we're, we're what, five months, six months into the, sea, into the year? Yeah. And I'll be a liar if I told you some days I'm overwhelmed and I want to quit. Then comes along a young kid, the other, maybe about two months ago, Ryan Al Hassan. He tells me, Hamo, I want to start an Emory Club in, at Dearborn High. Sometimes, to me, that's, that's, that's amazing. Somebody believed in you that much that want to start a club, a branch of what you did. How old is this kid? He's, I think, a junior in high school. Now, since he did that, Atzo wants to do one. Fortune wants to do one. Crestwood wants to do one. All the local high schools. To me, Sadaka, you know, we're all looking for Sadaka, for charity. Sadaka Jelia. Imagine you planted a seed in a young man that wants to give back. Is that what keeps you going on the kids, on the hard days? A hundred percent. When I want to give up and I say Ramadan's over, I was overwhelmed. I can't take it no more. I need a break. And a kid calls me. I want to feed in Palestine. Everything that's going on in Palestine, I want to help the people of Gaza. Can you tell somebody no? Or I want to help the people of Yemen. That's why I don't believe in nationalism. Because when we're stuck to our own, whether you be Lebanese or Yemeni or Palestinian or Iraqi or Suri, you limit yourself. You put me in a room with Yemenis, I'm a Yemeni. Mm. You put me with Iraqi, I'm a Iraqi. Palestine, I'm a Palestinian. Suri, Lebanon, I'll, I'll blend in anywhere. Because I think, think, think how Arabia was before. Yeah. They want us divided. Imagine how stronger we are if we were all one. Let me ask you this one last question. What scares you? The, most people will probably tell you failure. Mm. But it's not failure. What is it then? I don't know. Nothing family-wise, nothing community-wise scares you. In the sense of family and community? In general, yeah. Something uh, that scares you. Something that scares me is these new movements in our community. Mm. But we got to be strategic about them. Same way they were strategic coming into our community, you need to be strategic the way you fight them. You know, whether it be drugs, whether it be... Uh, the books that they talk about, whether it be the LGBT, you know, these are all things you can't, they're not things you fight by rolling up your sleeves and making a fist. That's not how we're supposed to fight. That's not how we're supposed to fight. But that's how people think they, that you fight things. You need to be strategic about them. Respect people for who they are. Yeah, but when something is threatening... The innocence of your children. 100%. And that's different. That's a different story. That's a different story. But even even then, I don't, violence is... Or like, it's, not the, it's not the solution. It's not how... It, nothing will work like that. Violence is not the solution. Violence is not the solution. And but, respect always has to be there, you know? So we need to come together. Where we need to come together starts at the top. Mm. Starts with the imams and our so-called community leaders. We need to find a way to work together to overcome a lot of the depressions, the drugs, you know, the, the whatever movements are going on in our community. Yeah. You know, 
I don't know what the right solution is or the right plan. We don't know what that is yet. Th- that is yet. But have we really tried? Not yet. Not yet. Not not at all. People talk it. But what? We still know, didn't come together and sit down and actually say like, okay, how are we going to move forward with this? We're still fighting Sunni Shia. <laughs> yeah. We're fighting Lebanon, Palestine, Yemeni, Iraqi, Syria. You know? We're distracted by the wrong things. We, we, and they want us distracted. And I'll tell you a funny story. And it's not about religion. But religion seems to be, you know, that's where everybody's most passionate. Yeah. That's why uh, religion always bring, comes up when, whenever you have any kind of discussion. Religion is always brought into it. Yeah. You know, because that's, you know, especially Muslims are the most passionate about the religion. Yeah. I find that. I might be wrong. You know, but growing up in Dearborn, you're around 90% Muslim. I was working in the jails one time and doing my rounds, and I had an African American guy tell me, Salaamu Alaikum, my brother. Tell him, Alaikum, Salaam, Rahmatullah. He goes, Sunni or Shia? And I had just. In, 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 in prison? Jail, in, in prison, in the county jail. So I turned around, I was about five steps away, past him. Turned around, I gave him a look. I go, you son of a, you just learned the religion and you're coming to talk to me about Sunni Shia? And I kept walking. I said, no, I'll come back in about two hours. Let it sink in his head. He's already divided. Yeah. And uh, that's, uh, yeah, I know he's already defeated. I don't yeah. care what you say. I don't care if you say Shia or you're, you say you're Sunni. You're defeated. Both ends, you lost. Because they want us there, like that. Yeah. So I come back around. He goes, he goes, Salaamu Alaikum. I go, I go, Alaikum Salaam, Rahmatullah. He goes, I'm sorry. I go, why are you sorry? He goes, uh, they want us divided. I go, my point exactly. See, but I take it to another level. It's not just in this, yeah. We're all on religion. Uh, is who we are. It's, it's, it's what's within us. It's inside of us. Arabs is who we are. Who we what we wear. What we wear. Yeah. How we act and stuff. You know, we have Christian friends who dress and eat and act just like we do. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So to me, is we're Arab first. Islam's are, uh, as a Muslim. That's our akhlaq. That's our, our our actions. Yeah, our ethics. Our ethics. When you look at us, we're Arabs first. Oh, he's an Arab. He's Lebanese. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I don't like to divide. On religion, religion's one thing, but Arabs in general. Yeah, that's the culture we're talking that's about. That's the culture. We need to stay there. I don't care if you're Christian. I got I got a Jordanian friend. That's probably. Probably closer to me than my own blood brother. Is closer to me than my own blood brother. He's a Christian Jordanian. Yeah. And his father and his mother, مثل أهله. We've lost that. You lost that. Because we let outside forces distract us. That's true. Thank you, Hajj. No, thank you. And I do want to say this. Last year I came to you and I told you that I wanted to start this podcast and you t- said that and you offered me your space when this is where we're sitting right now. So I want to make this clear, clear that if it wasn't for you, I probably wouldn't have been able to start this. So thank you again. And uh, I could talk to you all day. This was so much fun. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. To me, the pleasure was all mine. It's You took me places that I never, I didn't want to go. <laughs> we talked the bottom off camera. But Alhamdulillah, you know, you make it comfortable. And I'm ch- inshallah, it reaches the right people. Inshallah, I said the right things. And I'm not perfect. Please, and, don't take anything I say personal. Yeah. To me, I just like to see our community stronger. Yeah. Not in times of death or in times of, you know, certain events. Always. We need to be strong. To always. always. Not at convenience. And inshallah, we'll talk again. Inshallah, ya Rab. Habib. Habib, Arbeh.